a little bit about, so also I'm not affiliated with the Write the Docs organization. It's a fantastic organization, um, but I'm not affiliated with them. Uh, but auto-generate the docs didn't really roll off the tongue, so we're stuck with this title. Um, but they do really cool work, and you should check them out. Um, and I think Nathan, he was saying he knows the uh, LA chapter lead for Write the Docs, so you should hit him up. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm a senior data scientist on the integrated analytics team at Munich Re. Uh, Munich Re is a reinsurance firm, and I gave the same explanation last year. It's your insurance company needs insurance, and we provide the insurance for them. So it's insurance for insurance. It's very, uh, very interesting. Um, but uh, before I started Munich Re, I actually did a graduate degree in math. Um, which means I don't know how to write code, <laughs> as, as everyone assumes, yes. So I don't have software engineering background or anything, but um, I did do this fellowship, which was the Data Science for Social Good Fellowship at the University of Chicago, which takes uh, graduate students in uh, math, physics, any kind of applied discipline, um, and teaches them data science skills, including even you know how you should write Python code, how should you work in teams um, for social good projects. So in my time there, I worked with uh, the city of Milwaukee to identify students who are at risk of interacting with the criminal justice system. But, you know, this was uh, Obama era administration. Um, but, the, you know, after that, I left uh, the University of Chicago and I started working at Munich Re. And Munich Re, we're a relatively small team. We don't, we're not, um, we don't have you know, hundreds of data engineers or data scientists supporting us. We do um, lots, of, lots of our work is uh, one-off client analyses um, of their data, looking for insights, mining their data, and also deploying uh, products internally and externally. So when we were thinking about what does good documentation look like, um, we didn't really need, you know, uh, not everyone on our team or even, you know, I was not familiar with anything beyond writing doc strings like, oh, why would I ever need some further documentation beyond this? And so um, we talked about integrating Sphinx and uh, how that could work for our specific use case. So this talk is very much for, uh, you know, novices who've maybe never even heard of Sphinx. And I want to talk through like how easy it is, how we got around that, talk about like our use case, um, why, you know, the back end of Sphinx is very different than just publishing a simple readme or a markdown file, um, and some best practices, and talk a little bit about how we deploy our documentation for our team um, running local servers because uh, the data we work with is sensitive and some of our insights are sensitive. So, I think everyone knows why good documentation is important, mostly for your own use. You know, the person who suffers the most when you write poor documentation is you because you don't remember what that function with 15 inputs does. You know, first of all, a bad function with 15 inputs, but you know, I've been there. Um, and then uh, it, working in a heavily regulated uh, industry like life insurance or health insurance, uh, there's a lot of compliance factors with um, any transforms you may be applying to your data or any, um, for example, if I'm using a specific software or a specific piece of code to geocode against the census API, I need to make sure that um, the person using it next is using you know, the same versions. And um, so the documentation of your code there is very important. It helps these project transitions. You know, you maybe swamp your board on this one project. You're like, oh, well, there's an intern. Maybe they'd like to work on this project. And it makes their life very easy if um, you have good code. And then for us specifically, like collaborating on small teams, like we're working on projects between uh, with two to three um, people on staff, one data scientist, maybe two data engineers, something like that. Um, actually, it's usually two data scientists. One there's never enough data engineering support um, to go around. I don't know if anyone else can relate. but. The other you know, um, reason you need good documentation is working on very huge teams with the internet, right? open source projects. So um, I'm sure you've all um, seen some of the documentation around like Bokeh and sklearn. It looks so, so beautiful. And Bokeh specifically, they, um, their documentation is it's gorgeous. And they run their own like documentation server. And they've got all this customizations on Sphinx. But the back end of that is the same that um, uh, Streamlit is using. And Streamlit, the I think the founder of the um, startup presented yesterday. I was in his tutorial. And I went through. And I love looking at documentation. So I was like, oh, wow, he's just using Sphinx, just like everybody else. But it makes it all your documentation look really great. And 
So what is Sphinx? If you've never heard of it, it's a document generator and it takes plain text files and turns them into beautiful and shiny HTML PDFs. And um, if you've ever been on Read the Docs, um, Read the Docs, uh, all those different packages, the documentation is hosted in Sphinx. Um, and it auto generates these templated docs and takes care of all, all of that. And the great benefit of, of Sphinx is that, um, your documentation is then part of your source repository. So just how you version your code, um, you can then version documentation because it sits in your GitHub and, um, just how you set up continuous integration and deployment pipelines for your products or tools, you can do the same on your documentation. So, uh, for, for, uh, for, Okay, they won't even accept a pull request if it doesn't have some associated documentation changes with it. So that's, uh, that's an example there. So getting started with Sphinx is really, really easy. Anyone can do it. It's got these, you know, five commands that you run and it will, and the Sphinx quick start, what it does, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever used cookie cutter, but again, that templates. And it'll ask you a few questions, and then it will generate a directory structure um, uh, that, that will be leveraged to build out your documentation. So um, so I made a project called PyData. I've got my setup pi.py pi in there. And then within the docs, it set up these few files. So in this, I guess the things, uh, we'll go through them in, in order, but the make file is what is used to generate your documentation. So the few commands that, you know, you need to know off the top of your head, make clean, clean out all the old documentation generated, um, make HTML or make build. And you can customize it and um, for tools like, uh, or open service tools like sklearn and um, uh, Bokeh, if you've got access to uh, the, the server where they're deploying it like on AWS, you can publish using this uh, infrastructure to, to like the actual public repo. Um, in the build folder is where all your generated HTML folders, uh, uh, HTML files will live, which if you know anything about kind of web services, makes it really easy to deploy your documentation as something static because you can just zip all the files and move them over to a simple web service or server. Templates is where your templates live. I guess that's pretty straightforward. And conf.py is where um, you're going to specify any extensions you're using, the theme, um, and also specify any special things you want to import. So for example, the read the docs theme, um, you can install that as a package, and then you can import that into your um, conf.py and look really legit and use it as the extension. And the kind of the workhorse of all this is that is this index restructured text file, and this sets up um, your table of contents and specifies your directory structure and does it in an intelligent way. So the order in which you list the files will give Sphinx idea about what should be the previous chapter, what should be the next chapter, and all of those kind of automated things that um, you see on read the docs and other fancy looking files, but. Again, this was just five commands, and I already have all this generated. Um, what's next? Like, what do I need to know to start writing some files? Say I want to write like a tutorial for somebody to use this uh, new um, uh, tool I wrote. I wrote an extension to um, the census geocoding application, and I want to uh, make uh, make it so that somebody can use this like function that I've written. So. The thing you have to understand at that point is, well, what's the difference between restructured text and markdown? Markdown is very easy to use and everyone's very familiar with it. Um, and it's on GitHub, it's very well supported. Um, so restructured text and markdown are both popular markup languages. Uh, restructured text is the backend used by Sphinx, but markdown is used by um, applications like MKDocs, which work, which, uh, work along um, similar frameworks. But the way I've seen MKDocs used is to build out like really verbose kind of manuals or instructions. So if you go to the, so the Center for Data Science and Public Policy, they have a Hitchhiker's Guide to Data Science for Social Good. And it is incredibly verbose, teaches you how to scope a project. And um, the back end of that uh, Hitchhiker's Guide is MKDocs. And the reason it's MKDocs, because they wanted to make it like really, easy for people to contribute and Markdown is great because it's easy to learn and it's also great for writing for the web, which is blog posts or any kind of instruction or tutorial manuals that you wanna put out there. 
Restructured text, on the other hand, it's explicitly meant for writing technical documentation, and it has some functionality there that makes it um, easier to proceed in that direction because it will constrain you, but also give you enough freedom to uh, express yourself creatively. So the two big concepts in restructured text that if you're not familiar with it are uh, important is this idea of a directive um, and then we'll get into the next bit later. But uh, directive is structured like this. And uh, the standard way that a directive is called is you've got two periods, a space, the directive name, two colons, and whatever argument. Then in the next line, you put the options and the values, anything that you're adding there. And then the content of the directive follows. And the most important directive in, um, uh, in this environment is the table of contents tree that you'll write, and this sits in your index file. And this, you know, here I'll walk you through what it is. It's basically specifying, okay, here's the table of contents tree for this um, file. I want it to have a max depth of two, and that specifies that it will look in all of the documents listed and traverse their table of contents to a max depth of two. So um, for example, here I've listed, oh, I want to put the file intro structure and the file example. So if the file intro has a title, a subtitle, and a heading, it will go through heading and let you kind of, and I'll, I'll show what that looks like because I think talking through it is maybe not as effective. Um, but one other thing to notice here is um, even though these are uh, plain text files, so they're, they have the, the suffix RST, um, you don't need to specify the suffix and the order in which you list the files will specify kind of the um, hierarchy. So um, intro should always be first, the next chapter would be the structure, the next chapter would be example. And um, when it's specifying the name for the title of that page, it will take it from the title of whatever file you have specified, um, but maybe, you know, example, maybe the file example is just a snippet of Python code um, that I've put as a Python like code sample. So I want to give it another name. So I, you can use this HTML type um, inline kind of bracket structure to specify the name as example number one. So here's, I think this is the most important bit to know about restructured text and then everything kind of follows. Um, and then I can keep adding things to it. Okay, okay I want to add this idea of a caption and that's an option I'm putting there and then I can put you know the title contents and so what does this look like when I take this and I've got all these files and then I go and I generate this documentation ah, I can look like this um, and so as we talked about here so when I initialize the project I set the name as PyData 2019 and I set the author as Harim Naveed so those were the initialization steps. But look at, like, all I had to do in this was take all those restructured text files, which had a little bit of examples, um, and specify them in that index.rst. And this gives you the full navigation. And here you've got, like, a search option. You can search your documentation. And as this grows and as the projects you work on get bigger and bigger and as more people contribute, um, this helps make it like really helpful for a new person starting. We actually are using um, this framework to build our onboarding website for new hires because there's a lot of industry-specific language they need to know and um, um, machine learning techniques that we use specifically in uh, life insurance that are helpful. So this helps them. So it's like, here's how you set up. This is who you should talk to on your first day. Um, this is all the IT setup you need. These are all your cloud subscriptions you need access to. It's all to talk to. And then Okay, if you have some time, read these papers we've published. Um, if you want an exercise, you can go through like these exercises and whatever. So even setting that up, even though we're not explicitly using it to put up documentation, it's, it's our onboarding package. Um, so once you've got this idea of the directives down, so directives are, they basically are like big block lines of text, but how do you specify um, inline semantic text stuff? So if you're familiar with LaTeX, which unfortunately I wrote a lot of LaTeX in when I was in grad school, um, but you have to specify, for example, I want to bold this character, I want to put in this emphasis. So roles allow you to do this semantic inline text editing in that sense. And um, working in machine learning or any of this computational stuff, a lot of times you need to write math. So you can do, here's like a line I could put in 
in my sample code. Um, so in my restructured text file, I've got what is the outcome of, and then I've specified. Um, so remember, the, the format is the same every single time. There's a limited number of roles. So the role name is between two semicolons, and then you've got content with two of those back ticks. So I've got math, and then uh, I want this to look like math. And you can um, read the Sphinx documentation to find out uh, more about what that, what within like math. But generally, I find that it's LaTeX style uh, documentation. And then when it's generated, it'll look beautiful, and um, it's in line, and you didn't have to do too much. So um, between directives and roles, there's a lot to learn in restructured text that's different. Um, and I find this tool really helpful because it'll generate it automatically and you can look at and you can like change lines and it'll throw all the errors, you know, that when you try to compile your 16 documentation files and then you're like getting all these errors, you can try out little snippets here um, before you insert it. And it's pretty fun um, exercise. So now that we've talked through like this idea of these directives and these roles, and it's very high level, it gives you this mental model for how you should even think about your documentation um, as it should be intended for the end user. And I think here's just an example of uh, like a RST file. So, uh, so one of the things that's different between or that's a little weird in restructured text is you specify like section headings um, with punctuation. So it could be like any symbol as long as it's consistent for the same level header. So instead of using the dash under Python sample, I could have used periods. And then the next time I wanted the similar level of heading, I would just put periods. So make sure you have some consistency there because we had to instate it because some of our um, People would write things differently, but anyways. Um, so here's an example of a restructured text file where we specified the title is introduction, and then the subtitle here is Python sample. So remember our, our um, max depth was set to two. So when this documentation gets rendered, you'll see introduction and then Python sample as like a clickable sublink. Um, and then you've got, again, the same directive structure. You've got the two uh, periods. You're specifying we want to generate a code block. It's in Python. Um, so Sphinx is the de facto tool for Python, but they've been adding extensions. I think they've always had uh, support for C, and those are called domains, which are directives and roles that can be uh, put together for a specific language. Um, but I think it's the de facto tool for Python. And then I want to give it the caption this.py, and then I want to name it this.py, which I can then use um, for inline references later and could link there. Um, and I want to emphasize line three. And so here's my function. I do whatever. Is this thing on? What does that look like? All right, great. So we've got the introduction, the Python sample. Here we've got this um, Python specific highlighting, and then we get the emphasize on line three, which is is this thing on? Um, so you know if you're going through, um, you can think about you wrote a really complicated looking class, and you want to make sure it's like well documented for the next person coming along. You can use this emphasis to kind of point people to um, where, where things are important and whatnot. But remember we had this caption. Here's our caption, this.py. Um, and you can use this to reference, for example, if you pull a function out of a long module, you can be like, OK, well, this is being pulled from this module, so people can uh, refer back and forth. And so this, very beautiful, very easy to generate. Um, but how does that, how did I get it to, how did I get the screenshot? So basically, I updated all those files, and then I have to literally type in three more commands, which is make HTML, because that's what I want. Then I go to the Python 3, run the server, and then I go. Then I need to just go to this URL, because it'll be running locally. So we can see what that looks like, and uh, if it will break. That's the exact lines. We can type that, perfect. So, and then we'll do. So we'll start running. And then we can copy and paste this. Ah, great. Look, here's the beautiful documentation we were talking about. So I've got, you know, here's the introduction piece. And then we have the Python sample. So we have sample instructions, Python sample, the thing you saw earlier. 
and uh, here's like we can search here so we can see uh, I don't know is there the word outcome anywhere in the documentation and look you get this beautiful um, thing you're like oh well, I can go to this file and look it up here so um, it's very lightweight I ran a total of like eight commands and wrote maybe 10 lines to get this beautiful templating documentation instead of trying to figure something else out. So um, looks pretty cool. So I'm going to stop the server because I want to show something else. I should have run tmux first. It's OK. All right. So uh, here, here we've you know gone full circle. We downloaded Sphinx. We learned about directives and roles. We specified documentation for a few files, and then we got you know that uh, population together, and it's generated. So um, I don't have time to go into it, but one of the things you can also do is um, if you write really good doc strings, um, which you know everyone here does, right? We're all um, very good software engineers. We write good doc strings. Um, data scientists don't write good doc strings. They often write no doc strings at all. <laughs> they just write notebooks. Um, so when you have these doc strings, Sphinx also has these modules that lets you auto-generate documentation from there. So you've seen it probably on the um, sklearn documentation where it will show you, it will, um, if it's in a specific format, you can follow the, the Google standard and uh, it generates, um, it, it gives you the same kind of drop downs for your modules and lets you click in and look at the function, which is a really helpful um, way to set up your documentation if a developer is going to be using it to, you know, write their own code or develop off of it. I've kind of been keeping this, okay, what would somebody need if they were writing a tutorial or something along those lines? But one of the things that, you know, I really promised in the session was if you've ever wondered how those really sexy, you know, read the docs or generate, how do we get there? Well, that's very easy. The only thing we have to do here is we go to our conf.py. And remember, this is our main, main master. And so this generates you know, project, the copyright. Um, and then we've already got a few extensions uh, installed and downloaded. So you install inst extensions using pip again. So the extension I want to use is the Sphinx theme. And then I've got a notebook extension installed. And I'll tell you how we use that. And then all I will do is scroll down and update the, the theme from Alabaster to this theme. We'll do make clean, clean up all the old documentation, make HTML. Uh-oh. This may be bad. All right. That's why they don't do the live demos. I see. Perfect. So now we've built this documentation file, and uh, we'll view it the same way we saw the other one. And you can just navigate also. Ah, great. Does this read the docs or what? So you can go through and also look at it. There's nothing in structure. Sounds about right. Nothing here. But you know, you can go through uh, that. I don't know why that didn't generate. But that's OK. If you ignore that bit, everything else looks great. And again, similar, you've got the search functionality you had earlier. And um, you can go through and look at specifically your indices and specify more things there. And uh, the one thing that's really nice about this template um, is they'll give you this idea of like next. I don't know why they're not generating so nicely. But they usually look a lot better. Yes. But so you can, this, this idea that we talked about, about this hierarchy, which is like next and previous, which is really nice for putting together um, your packages. OK. So that's probably it. OK. So I'll stop this one last time, because I want to show one more thing. OK. So um, that's how you get the very cool read the docs theme. Um, and I think that's basically all uh, I promise. But no, there's more. Um, the next bit is, OK, I've got this great uh, documentation. It looks so great. How do I get it deployed? So Read the Docs has a specific infrastructure where like, you can integrate your uh, GitHub repos in with Read the Docs, and then they'll publish it. And they, uh, But the back end is always Sphinx, and that's the same. But Python hosted, what you can do is you can zip all the HTML files you want to upload and just 
upload them to this uh, pythonhosted.org and they'll display your documentation and give you a URL that you can direct people to for your packages. So um, we use Azure because financial services. Um, and one of the ways that we built this documentation because some of our data sets are very sensitive. For example, we have mortality data on 25 million lives in the United States for the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years. And so um, if we're publishing some EDA or showing some new analyses on this, um, all of our documentation is restricted. It's on a VNet server, and we use the um, authentication within Azure to restrict access. So um, our documentation or any um, our, our modeling packages are restricted on the service. So what we do is we use the Azure App Service, and um, I'm not sure if anybody uses Azure DevOps, but it's basically Microsoft's answer to GitHub, or maybe they bought GitHub, so I don't know if it's the same thing. But um, it lets you set up these CI CD pipelines, and you can generate the same documentation and serve it in very simple four steps. Um, one is you set up your package. The second bit is you run make HTML. Then you copy the HTML from the build folder to this artifact directory in the app service. And then you can publish the documentation as an artifact in the container. And now, because this is running on a container, you can give it some fancy URL. So, you know, we can call it mortality.meanagree.com. We can't do that. But, you know, some people have tried. Um, but for us, we also find this really useful if we're publishing client specific documentation. So, we'll deploy client models at um, insurancecompany.meanagree.com slash. Uh, smoker model slash, and then at the next bit, we can give slash documentation. And that helps um, the developers on their end get access and uh, keep to updating their um, plugins and integrations with the models that we have deployed. And so this is, we find the Azure App Service does a pretty good job of this. But again, our back end on all this is always the restructured text and the Sphinx. And so I, most data scientists, all you do is write notebooks. You know, somebody asked me to write a script, I get scared. So um, one of our workarounds for this is, well, not workarounds, it's, it's a really cool thing you can do, is this idea of this uh, NB Sphinx extension. And I'll give you an example of how you can update your, one, how you can update your index. So, okay, let's see here. Okay, I've got this Iris example IPython notebook in my directory. So I'll go to my index and... I will just add in iris example. So uh, remember, you don't need to specify the um, uh, the file extensions for this to work. And so we'll run this again, make HTML, and we'll see if this works. Uh, it's not so that's like the IPython check uh, the checkpoints, which is fine. Um, oh, right, this won't work in this theme, so we'll just update the theme or we'll go back to the old theme for some reason. And I always forget whim sh shortcuts in front of a crowd, so don't judge me for scrolling. Um, okay, so we'll do the same thing. We'll run make HTML. Cool, so now let's see what this looks like again. Again. And just scroll through. Ah, oh, here we've got now like a notebook generated. And this is just uh, some SK Learn documentation example that I copied and pasted. But it can generate now your figures. So if you want to save your notebooks with outputs too, um, so it's like, oh, well, I did this analysis and I found that it does this. And I find this really helpful for writing tutorials um, because, you know, the more verbose something is or the more pictures there are, the more people will follow. So there's that. And I just want to emphasize how easy Sphinx makes it, right? So I just moved um, this notebook into the same directory so I could reference it. And then I all I had to do was specify the name of the file, add in one extension, and it generated that. So if you didn't want, if your documentation, if you want it to be all Jupyter notebooks for this new package or this new modeling pipeline you've built, um, you could do that too. So... How does Sphinx tie it all together? Like, what's going on in the back end? And is it right to say that Sphinx is um, giving you this beautiful documentation? So, well, the back end of Sphinx is docutils, which is another, um, it's an open source, and it processes plain text files into HTML. Um, and I think one of a really good, uh, I, I actually saw a Sphinx talk at PyCon, and they gave a really good example saying, um, if docutils is like the machine, then Sphinx is the factory 
for your documentation. And um, so this, the markup is actually parsed by docutils into a tree of nodes. So it breaks down your document into um, the high level kind of structure. So the title, the sections, and the body elements. And the things that talked about directives and these roles, um, they're actually extensions of docutils frameworks, but they work really well. Uh, and Sphinx has defined custom ones so you can write code for your Python projects. And so a good way to think about it, it's Sphinx uses docutils and docutils uses the restructured text. And um, I think that's a good thing to know because if you want to start writing your own custom themes for Sphinx, um, you actually have to go back and learn a lot more about docutils so you can build your own custom themes in that too. So now we've come to the final uh, piece, which is what are the best practices for setting up documentation? What I've learned in working with many different types of people, working with non-technical, working with people with skill levels all the way from intern all the way to you know, lead engineers, is the mental model for documentation is there's about three types. And especially in like a private entity where maybe you're not open sourcing all your projects, um, there's the tutorial, there's the guide, and then there's the reference. And each of these serve a different audience. So the tutorial is very much for somebody who's never used your package and it should have very illustrative example, a hand wavy thing about what it's supposed to do, what you intended, and maybe list the limitations. The guide on the other hand is for maybe a developer who's um, getting more familiar with a new tool. And then a reference is um, a developer who's reading code. And this is where some of the auto generation from doc strings that Sphinx provides comes in really useful. So you can write a tutorial, which um, is probably what I think a lot of people end up using Sphinx for, especially in smaller data science functions like, like so on our team. Um, and guide and reference, like for example, the scikit-learn documentation is a beautiful example of documentation as reference and also tutorials and also something of a guide where they talk about their design philosophy and things like that. So. The last piece is what I've heard told to me by my manager when I don't write my documentation is write early, write often, um, describe your inputs, describe your outputs, talk about code objectives, your design philosophy, and give very illustrative examples for the tutorials that you want to write. And make sure your tutorials work. Like sometimes you'll push changes but not update the documentation and uh, somebody will come barging in like, ah, oh, this doesn't work the way you said because all the dependencies disappeared. So an another you know, great extension or tool you can use is doc tests, which will run all your little Python snippets and make sure the output is what you expect it to be, things like that. Um, and I think that's all I have. I don't think we have too much time for questions. You can come talk to me after, um, but I'll put this presentation up somewhere so you can access it and um, play around with restructured text. <laughs>